welcome everyone. Uh, as I mentioned before, we're, we're going to have a live overview and demo of Fluency Tutor for Google, uh, which hopefully several of you have, have heard of or, or tried and have some questions and some feedback and those sort of things. Um, just to let you know who I am, so I'm Jason. I'm the Global Product Manager here at TextHelp, so I, I look over a lot of our educational products, especially those that are used in Google Apps for Education, or now I guess we would call it G Suite. Um, prior to coming with TextHelp, I was a I, I was an instructional technology consultant, an assistive technology consultant in the state of Kentucky for a little over 10 years. So I've had plenty of experience working with all grade levels and ability levels um, with technology to, to kind of help them increase achievement and those sort of things. So I look forward to any questions you all may have as we continue through the presentation today. Uh, if, if you need to get a hold of me, I've put my Twitter handle up there, so you can always find me on Twitter or just drop me an email at j.carroll at texthelp.com. So uh, I've just the slide here, many of you are probably here because of a webinar that Vicki Davis did just a few weeks ago on the 15 best tools for G Suite users. And in that, several different tools were, were mentioned. Uh, Fluency Tutor was one of those, and we had a lot of questions and feedback that came in from that. So we thought, hey, let's just offer a live demo and show what Fluency Tutor is and how to use it and some of the best practices, answer questions and all those um, sort of things. So I wanted to reference that because if that's why you're here, we'll, we'll welcome back. I'm glad you attended that webinar, and I hope you enjoyed it. If you're here and you, you didn't attend that webinar, we will do a follow-up email after this, uh, probably tomorrow or early next week, and you'll get a copy of, of the webinar that I'm doing now, the Fluency Tutor demo, but we'll also include a link to the 15 Best Tools uh, webinar from Vicki as well, so you'll have access to it. It's, it's a really great resource if you, uh, if you haven't seen it yet. There's also a nice little um, one-pager, I guess it's actually a two-pager maybe, uh, handout that, uh, that goes along with it that we'll be sure to include as well. So. Be sure to keep a, a lookout for that. So before we get into the actual content, I always like to do a little bit of housekeeping to make sure we're all on the same page. You already know who I am. Uh, I want to make sure that you understand how to get the most out of the webinar as far as uh, the platform that we're using here. So we're using GoToWebinar, and I think this screenshot's a little bit old, but I wanted to make sure that we had the right view uh, from what you guys are seeing. Hopefully you can hear me. If not, then uh, I'm not sure how I'm going to be able to solve that issue because you can't hear what I'm saying now. But assuming that you can hear me, um, you'll see that you have a GoToWebinar panel. And from that, uh, there's some control panel features you'll see over on the right side of your screen, this, uh, this, this, this sidebar here. You'll have some little arrows that you can click, and that will either kind of bring the sidebar out or, or minimize it a bit so it's not taking up your whole screen. You'll also see the audio mode. You know, I always use the mic and speakers, and so if you guys are using mic and speakers, that's great. If the connection gets bad, if you want to dial in using a telephone, you can switch the telephone and do that as well. Probably the most important part of the questions. If you have questions, there will be a questions panel there. You can just ask your question, and, uh, and we'll answer it as best we can. I'll get to some of these at the end of the webinar or maybe even in between here and there, but uh, I also have Kathleen and Caitlin here on the other end. And they keep track of those questions that come in as well. So, so if they see one uh, that they know the answer to, they can um, they can easily answer that. So, hopefully, that's the main stuff with um, with housekeeping. There, we could do a little we could do a little activity here to make sure that you guys uh, that it's working okay for you. If you can find the questions panel, uh, it wouldn't actually be a question you're asking me, but but can you tell me where you're from? Uh, so, just the city and state, or school district, or any any whatever you feel most comfortable with. If you can do that, that would let me know that um, that it's working all right for you. And you can't see my panel, but I'm just hopping over to take a look at it. Right, great. We got uh, several Canadians here: Ottawa and uh, Edmonton, another Ontario, uh, South Carolina. Nice, Nicholasville, Kentucky. We're neighbors. I am in Lexington, Kentucky, right now. So very cool. Kansas City, Missouri. Hamilton, New Zealand wins the furthest uh, distance award, I believe. And Marvin from California. Hi, Marvin. 
Very cool. Uh, Australia, wouldn't they have to get the measurer out there? Australia may uh, have the New Zealander beat there. Very cool. So, hey guys, thanks so much. It looks like this is working out. So now you know where to ask questions at. So you can pop those in there and uh, I'll either get around to them or Kathleen and, and Caitlin can help with that as well. Okay, so let me go back into presentation mode here and move on uh, to the next screen, right? That's my reminder to get started. Everyone needs one of, uh, one of those screens. So just to kick things off, I, I want to do kind of reality a check. I, I like to start with why before I get into the how. And, and I want to talk about why does Fluency Tutor exist, how can it help us, and all those sort of things. You know, there's a lot of struggling learners, and it's not, like, it's not only a U.S. thing. It's not only a special ed thing. It's not only an English language learner thing. It's just a thing that, that many of our students are dealing with. And so this stat does come from the U.S., and it's representative of, of all the states in the U.S. combined, but you're going to have similar stats in Canada and Australia and New Zealand as well. And one thing that we're dealing with here is that, that over 60% of the fourth graders and eighth graders are scoring below proficiency in reading. And this has shown up time and time again for the last 30 years, regardless of all the different initiatives that we've tried. And when I say score below proficiency, I mean proficiency is being able to make sense out of a grade level textbook. So if you're scoring below that, obviously that's going to cause all kinds of issues as you move forward in, in your studies and grades and things like that. Because of that, we get this achievement gap that is well documented in the, in the research. And the achievement gap is interesting because if you look at the, at the bottom left corner, all the kids start out achieving the same, but then at some point, some kids stop progressing while others keep moving along. And if you remember those stats that I just showed you, it didn't say that 60% of fourth graders score below proficiency, but only 30% of eighth graders score below proficiency. It was 60% of fourth and eighth graders. So what happens is once these kids fall behind, they stay behind. They don't catch up a couple of years later. Uh, they, they continue to fall behind or at least stay behind as other kids progress. And this achievement gap is a real problem. And as I mentioned before, it's not a special education problem. It's not an English language learner problem. It's just a problem that impacts lots and lots of students. Now, the good news is, is that technology can help, right? And we'll get into to how technology can help. But I want to start with saying that how, how we can really help students is helping them become an avid reader. And becoming an avid reader will change a student's life for the better. And this quote, I think, really explains why that is. And when I say an avid reader, just so we're all on the same page, I'm talking about a kid who loves to read. A kid that you don't have to make get out their textbook and start reading. They want to just pick up a magazine of something interesting and read through it, and they just read for enjoyment. And so we know that a child who becomes an avid reader will have consumed 400 times more text by the age of 16. 400 times more text. So again, if, if you don't mind to participate with me in that little questions panel, instead of this being a question, it's just an answer again. I guess it's me asking you a question, but what, what does that do for that 16-year-old? If you're talking to two 16-year-olds, and one of them has read 400 times more text than the other, what does that mean for that student? What do you guys think about that? Increases their experiences and knowledge, for sure, Tara has said. More opportunities, definitely, Carolyn. More opportunities, uh, there's no doubt about that. That uh, for And everything from uh, from better choices in school to the workplace to relationships, richer vocabulary, definitely. I mean, just imagine the vocabulary coming out of, of one of those students' um, mouths versus the other if they read 400 times this more. So uh, increased vocabulary and language for writing, better communication skills, right? So there's so many positive things that can come out of that. Um, so I just want to reiterate how important it is for students to become avid readers and, you know, we need to do everything that we can to foster that. And again, you know, technology can help with that. Um, now, for a student to be an avid reader, they first need to be a fluent reader. So what is fluent reading? What is fluency? 
And fluency is the ability for an individual to read quickly, but at the same time reading accurately and using expression when they read. And now the standard that we usually measure this in is words correct for minutes. So if a student were to read aloud for one minute, how many mispronunciations would they make? How many omissions would they make? And then from that, we can calculate their words correct per minute. And there are norms associated with this and all that sort of stuff. But that's how, that's, that's how we gauge whether someone is a fluent reader or not. So then, so how do we do this right now? How do we teach kids to read fluently? Teaching is probably, I guess there's two things. How do we teach kids and then how do we assess them? Teaching, we have very specific strategies that you, you can use to target uh, fluency and, and reading quickly while not making errors in expression and those sort of things. And then you get to assess how a student's doing. And typically that is like the most uncomfortable part of the whole thing. If you guys, uh, if you guys have had the opportunity to do this, it's where you ask a student to read for a minute, and you're pretty much you pretty much have a stopwatch while that student is reading, and you're marking through if they did this right or or that wrong, and you're trying to keep up with what they're reading. It is a kind of a time-consuming process, and it's a stressful process for kids and that sort of thing. Uh, but it but it is how the the standard for how we calculate words correct per minute. Now again, thankfully the technology and what I'm going to show you in Fluency Tutor can really help with this. Not only does it make things more comfortable and give kids more confidence, uh, but it allows it to all be done with technology instead of some of the time-consuming methods that we, uh, that we often have to use. So that's where Fluency Tutor for Google comes in. Now, if you haven't used or heard of Fluency Tutor for Google much, uh, if, if you haven't messed with it or haven't heard of it, there's, there's, a, there's several things that it does. Just to give you the high-level overview right before I go in and, and go into demo mode here, so Fluency Tutor for Google is a Google app, so you get it from the Chrome Web Store, and it supports struggling readers and English language learners. It'll support all emerging readers or, or just students that are learning to read. It definitely improves confidence when reading aloud. As you'll see, students can read passages, and then they can listen to see how they did, and if they don't like it, they can just do it again, and then when they're ready, they can send that to the teacher, and the teacher can give them feedback and those sort of things. If you're a Google user, it can be easier. It integrates directly with Google Drive and Google Classroom. And the great thing is it allows for real-time teacher and student feedback, so the student knows. The teacher immediately sees what the student's doing and can provide feedback, and the student knows, or can find out what they need to do to improve. And uh, it enables both teachers and students to choose passages. So obviously, Fluency Tutor will have some passages embedded in it that you can use to share with students, but students can go out on the web and find anything that they're interested in, turn that into a reading passage, practice reading it, send it over to you as an educator to give them feedback. So uh, lots of cool things that Fluency Tutor does. Uh, slides are nice and all, but I'm sure it would make more sense if I would go into a demo here and, and, and show you how it works. So let's do that now. Let's take a look at Fluency Tutor. Uh, I'm going with the assumption so there are several people on here, and uh, it's, it's hard to assume that uh, the knowledge level of everyone, so I'm just kind of starting at the beginning and rolling through it here. Uh, but I will keep a, a good pace going, so hopefully I won't put anyone to sleep. So the first thing you have to do is get Fluency Tutor, and, and where do you do that? And, and you would get it, if, if you're using G Suite for education, you're, you're probably going to get that from the Chrome Web Store. If you're a Google administrator, if, if you look after the Google implementation in your district and you have access to the Google Admin Console, then you can easily push Fluency Tutor out or deploy that out to all the kids so the next time they log in to Chrome or open the Chromebook, they'll have access to it. Uh, otherwise, like I said, you just get it from the Chrome Web Store. So if you don't already have it, real easy to do. You go to the Chrome Web Store. How do you get to the Chrome Web Store? You just Google Chrome Web Store, and it's always the, uh, the first thing that pops up. Once you get to the Chrome Web Store, you just type in Fluency Tutor. And I'll click Enter, and you see there's an extension and themes and those sort of things, but we're looking for apps. So we're looking for the Fluency Tutor for Google app. Now, mine just says Rate It because, uh, because I can't install it. It's already installed. For you guys, you'll see that you can add it to Chrome. And so you just click Add to Chrome, that adds Fluency Tutor to your apps, and then you can access it. Now the next question is, well, how do you get to your apps? So if you're using the Chrome Web Browser, uh, a couple of different ways you can do it, you, and you're going to have to use the Chrome Web Browser if you want to access Fluency Tutor. 
the way I always get to it is you see I have my bookmarks bar here and on the left I have the thing called apps. If you click on apps, it just pops your apps up. I've got a couple of pages worth of apps here. If you don't have that button for some reason, you know, if you can see the URL bar here, you can just type in Chrome colon slash slash apps. That'll take you to the apps that you have installed. If you're using a Chromebook, usually you can click a little um, apps icon down at the bottom left corner and that will open up all your apps. So lots of different ways that you can get to it. But uh, once you get there, you'll see a list of all the apps you have installed. Fluency Tutor for Google is one of those apps. And now to open that, all I have to do is click on it. Now the first time you open the Fluency Tutor, it's going to, uh, so you can see I've already used it. I've got this whole recent activity and all that sort of stuff that, that I, I'll explain what all this stuff we're looking at is. But the first time you open Fluency Tutor, it's going to ask you if you're a teacher or a student. And then it's going to have a little video for you that gives you an overview on how it works. So it's, it's a quick two minute, three minute video. It gives you the basics and, and gives you everything you need to get started. There's also some little pop-ups that'll show up the first time that, you, that you're in here that'll tell you how to get started. So a lot of built-in support there for you already uh, that you'll have. Now if you choose teacher, it's going to take you to a teacher dashboard. If you stu choose student, it'll take you to a student dashboard. So right now I am, uh, I'm in as a teacher, obviously, and it says here is my recent activity. Now the first time you open Fluency Tutor, this is going to be blank because you don't have any recent activity. Um, I log in and I have this recent activity from people that I've shared passages with and all that sort of stuff. You can see Kathleen is the most recent person that's uh, read a passage that I assigned to her and it shows some of the tools she used and, and all that sort of stuff. So from the teacher view, what you mainly do is assign passages to students that they can practice reading, record themselves reading, then share back with you so you can assign those passages then you can also assess those passages. So after they're done and they've recorded it, you can go in, find their reading passages, uh, listen to how they did, give them feedback and all that sort of stuff. So let's start with the first part, which is assigning a reading passage to a student. And you do that by going to the share a passage option. So over here on the left, you'll see all, all your options and those sort of things. Uh, and share a passage is the first one. And there's even a couple of different ways to share a passage. We have a little under 500 reading passages already in Fluency Tutor, ready to go. They've been Lexiled. We even have some other reading levels that you can look at. So those are there, ready to go. There's a reading age associated with them. You can share those. It's completely free. Everything I've shown you so far is completely free. You can log in, share it, and let students start practicing. So let's say that, for example, I want to, uh, let's just look at one of these things here, 3D movies. So if I look at 3D movies, it shows me what the, what the text of that passage is. And so this is what the students would see. And I can say, all right, is this, you know, is this the right content for the student or I want to go back and share something else? And then there's also comprehension questions as well that I can look at. Now comprehension questions are available for all of the, for all of the Fluency Tutor passages that are here um, that, that are built in, but now if you go out and you find some content on the web, obviously it's not going to have comprehension questions that comes along with it there. When I'm ready, whenever I find that this is the right passage for me, all I have to do then is go and share that, and I can share that through Google Classroom, or I can share it through Drive. Now I don't have an education account, so therefore I don't have access to Google Classroom. You can see that it's all grayed out, uh, but I can share with Google Drive. So if I click on that, it just pops up this share dialog that you're probably used to seeing if you use Google. It's just like if you're sharing a Google Doc. And so I just go and enter the name. I'm going to share this with myself uh, just so I can show you the student view. Uh, I can also share one with Kathleen there who, who was, uh, was reading the passage earlier. And I hit send. So now these passages, uh, these passages are shared, and the student will get a notification that, that shows that a passage has been shared, and they can, they can open that up and check it out. So let me show you what that looks like real quick. Um, if I, so I've opened up, I'm, I've opened up a new window here that, that hopefully you all can see, and now I'm just in, in my personal Google Drive account, which I'm using as a student account. So on the teacher end of things, you've shared this content with a student, and then the student can look in Google Drive or look on their uh, 
on their Fluency Tutor dashboard, and they'll see that they have a new passage assigned to them. When I click on it, you can see it's asking, uh, sorry, I had to sign in. So this is what the student sees. It's a real clean passage text that a student can look at and uh, you know see all the words and all that kind of stuff. And then there's some support tools built in as well. So the student gets this passage and they can do a few things. They, if they're ready, they can just take off immediately and click record. And they can record this and it'll get shared right back with the teacher and that'll be that. But if they need some support, there's some other things they can do. And I bet that you're not going to be able to hear this. But let me give it a go. People everywhere enjoy going to the movies. They like watching this. Right, so I'm not sure if you guys can hear that or not. But you should at least be able to see this highlighting thing that's going on. And what's happening is it highlights a sentence and then it reads each word of the sentence. And as that word's read aloud, it does this alternate highlighting thing that, uh, that a lot of times help us helps with comprehension and kind of word recognition and those sort of things. So that's a really nice feature because students can listen to hear what this is supposed to sound like before they take off and read it. Now I, I should mention that if you don't want kids to have access to this, um, my daughter using this was a good example. She would, she would go and I, I would assign a passage to her and she would go in and listen to how every word is supposed to sound and then by the time she went and practiced reading it would sound perfect. There'd be no mistakes whatsoever, right? And it was because she used these support tools. So there's, there's a way that if you want to do what we call cold read, and I'll show you that when I go back, you can do a cold read setting um, so that students don't have these support tools available. So one support is being able to have it read aloud. You can also change the voices. You know, if you get Spanish text in here, you could make it default or the kid could switch it over to a Spanish voice and then they could listen to it read in Spanish. There's also a dictionary. So uh, if, if I went to highlight a word and click on the dictionary, it'll give me the definition. If I want that read aloud, I can click on the definition and, uh, and it will read that out loud. Picture diction dictionary is the same thing. If I click on that, you see it will give me uh, an image that's associated with it. It's from the widget symbol library, if you're familiar with that, uh, that it will show me. I can use the translator. I can adjust the reading speed. It gives me this little text difficulty measure on kind of a four bar. Uh, level there to tell me how difficult it is. So, so different supports that you have in there that a student can use before they record. And then when they're ready, they just simply click the record button, click start recording, and then you start reading. So if I'm the student, I would just say, people everywhere enjoy going to the movies. They like the show on the big screen. They also like eating popcorn with friends and family. So I'm going to go ahead and stop. You may notice it actually said uh, that the recording is saved. So the recording is saved, and then there's even a little notification because I'm signed in as a teacher as well. Uh, I got a little Chrome notification that said that somebody had finished reading a uh, finished making a recording. So that's just some stuff on the teacher end that you'd have access to. Um, now you should a student should you should encourage them to read the whole passage. I just didn't want to subject you all to listen to me read the entire passage. Uh, so I stopped after the first sentence. So that's what the student can do. If at any time, if they want to, they can go back to reading, and they can uh, use the dictionary and picture dictionary and listen to it again, and then go right back to recording when they're done. And then they can also click uh, they're finished, and if you've assigned comprehension questions, then they can get the comprehension questions there as well. So that's the whole student experience. Um, I'm just going to go back to the teacher side of things again and go to recent activity. And once it loads up, you should see, right, okay, so you should see here, uh, I just finished reading 3D movies, and it tells me that I use the dictionary and the picture dictionary, and if I wanted to, I could create a vocabulary list, but they only had one word. Kathleen did better, actually, because she, uh, she looked up companion in the dictionary, but then she translated two words, and then she used the picture dictionary for two other words. And if I wanted to create a vocabulary list again, you could see that it would have all those words in it that Kathleen's looked up. So it does give you some nice little visual prompts about some support tools that the uh, student had used. Before I forget, if I go to share a passage again and I just pick one of these random uh, passages, we looked before the passage text and we saw they had comprehension questions. There are settings that go along with it. Um, almost can't see it because of the little go-to webinar sidebar. Here you can choose the default 
reading voice that's going to show up for the student in the translation language. So if you were to, I'll show you in a minute how to make your own content. If you were to select your own content and it was Spanish, you could easily change the default voice over to a Spanish voice, and that's what would read when the student pressed play. Uh, same for French um, as well. And then on reading options, here's the thing. If you want to make students answer comprehension questions, you check that box, and that means kids can't be done with it. When they hit unfinished, it takes them to the comprehension questions. We talked about a cold read earlier. If you don't want them to have text-to-speech and talking dictionaries and picture dictionaries, you can use the cold read tool, and then you can just kind of make this the default. So every time you assign a passage, it would, it would use these options if you want to. So those are some of the options that you can do when assigning a passage. Right, so so far uh, we've covered like why would you want the extension, where do you get the extension, how do you access the extension once you install it, how do you assign some passages. In addition to the passages that we have, there's a couple other things you can do. One is that you can create your own content. So if I click create content, I can enter a title, I can give it a description, I can choose the language that I'm typing it in, and then I can go and type that text in or copy and paste some text in from somewhere, preview it, and then share that with a student just like we did before. So you can already see, once you run out of passages from the default ones that we have installed, you can make your own and you can make as many as you want for this. Um, and other than that, it works the same way. There's also settings, the same settings that you saw before, except comprehension questions. There won't be any comprehension questions for this. We only have those for the um, kind of the passages that come with Fluency Tutor. And then last but not least, there's a Chrome extension. So I already have the Chrome extension. When you click this, it'll prompt you to install it. And then if you uh, look at my Chrome web browser here, you can see I've got this little Fluency Tutor icon installed. Uh, so, so clicking install there will add the icon. Um, to the Chrome web browser. And then what that does is anytime that you're on a website somewhere, so if I go here to learn the basics, um, I just click learn the basics of, uh, sorry, this global climate change website that I pulled up. I can click the Fluency Tutor extension and turn this into a Fluency Tutor passage. Right, so now same as before, now I'm just taking that web page, I've turned it into a Fluency Tutor passage. I can go and edit some stuff out if it didn't look right. And then it's got my source here where I got it from and when I'm ready. Again, I can share that with individual students using Google Drive, or I can use Google Classroom and share it with my whole class. So three ways that you can share content. You can share the roughly 500 passages we have, you can make your own passages, or you can use this little Fluency Tutor extension to create passages from websites and Google Documents. So that, that kind of takes us through how we get content to share with students and what students see and how they make recordings. Now I need to take us into how we assess and give feedback to the recordings once students go and, and you know record themselves reading it. So I've talked a lot in this 30 minutes. I don't, Kathleen, I don't know if, or Caitlin, are there any questions that I need to answer now or should I just crack on? I think we're good right now. We had a couple questions about how to track progress and, and kind of look at the data, but I'm assuming you'll get to that, so we'll hold off. Um, other than that, I think we're good to keep moving. Awesome. Good stuff. Uh, yep. Right on. I'm going, to, I'm going to get into that stuff now with the tracking progress and those sort of things, and then uh, I'm sure all the other uh, questions that you have that Kathleen and Caitlin will uh, be able to answer there for you. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Here is the – so I didn't do much of a recording. But here is the, re the most recent recording for me that just came in, and uh, there's a couple of things. I can see Alexile in a DRA level um, because this was a passage that comes with Fluency Tutor. If you get a passage from the web or you make your own, it's not going to auto Alexile it, uh, so you won't have those numbers here, kind of like these that we're looking at uh, that have just the dash marks by them. But because this was a native Fluency Tutor passage, it does have Alexile with it. And to let you know kind of how that works, uh, Lexile is a big thing in the U.S. I don't think it's used much in Canada. I'm not sure about some of the other areas uh, that are on the call. If you look up at the top right of my screen, and if you have Fluency Tutor, the top right of your screen, there's some settings. A couple of things you can do. Uh, one of those things are preferences. 
so if I go to, uh, if I click on preferences, there are just some settings, general settings that I can do in Fluency Tutor. And one is to enable notifications so you get those Chrome notifications when a student finishes reading a passage. And another is the text maturity measure for our native passages. Lexile is there by default, but if you see another one on here that you want, you can choose that as well. So I've got the DRA um, on there, but the guided readings one, accelerated reading, all those are there. They are approximations, but they're pretty close. So if you want to uh, pull one of those in, you can, and that way you can, you can see that leveling um, as well. Right, okay, so uh, back to where I was. We need to get into to how we score these and give feedback and that sort of thing. Just going to get back to, to my main recent activity dashboard. So you see I only spent 13 seconds um, reading. Now you really want kids to read over a minute because the whole metric we're looking at is words correct per minute. Uh, again, I was just doing a quick demo there. But if I click, you can see if I uh, hover over the green option here, it says score detail. If I click on that, so here you can see an earlier one I already scored and it has 387 as the score. Again, that was me just kind of doing a quick demo. There's a couple of things you can do. One, I can hit play here and listen to the reading, and I can give a thumbs up message, or I can ask students to try reading it again. Um, the reason this is separated out from the more detailed scoring is because this is part of the free, this is the free part of Fluency Tutor. So Fluency Tutor is a free slash premium product. And for free, you get access to Fluency Tutor, you get access to all those passages, those 500 or so passages that we have. You can share those passages with students. Students can use those support tools. Students can practice reading it aloud and listen back to it. They can then share it back with the teacher. You're going to see this recent activity screen with how long they read and the tools that they used. You're going to be able to click this score button, listen to it, and then give them a thumbs up saying nice job or ask them to try it again. Um, all that is completely free. Where the premium side comes in, is if you, you want to use the Chrome extension to get content from the web, or if you want to uh, score the passage in more detail. So here I'm going to click score this passage, and it's going to take me to a score screen that looks kind of like the student reading screen. Um, and the way this works, as you can see, I've got these play and stop buttons, and I also have select recording. I only made one recording, but I think this is, is one of the more interesting things. If a student made three or four tries before they clicked on finish, you would have all of those tries here so that you could go and listen to their first one versus their second one versus their last one. And then you ch choose the one, which is probably the last one that you want to score. And I can hit play. I'm not sure that you're going to be able to hear this. I'll just say people everywhere enjoy going to the movies. They, so I can hear that reading aloud, and it's always the worst thing ever, in my opinion, to, to have to listen to yourself read. Uh, so anyways, I, I was reading along as I hit play, and I can just follow along with my cursor. And whenever it gets to one of these areas, I, um, you know, I just click on a word. I said, uh, I, I left out the word going and to. I said people everywhere enjoy the movies. So I could click on going and say a mission. And on two, I also had an omission. And you see what that does is over here on the right, it says, OK, there's two omissions. And then that automatically updates the words uh, per minute and the words correct per minute, as well as the percent of words correct and the error rate. And all these metrics over here are automatically updated as you score that. Now, these are bad examples because, again, I didn't read for a full minute. So because of that, it, you know, it has to assume you read for at least a minute. So that's why these are artificially high numbers. Um, but if the student reads for at least a minute, it's going to automatically calculate all these numbers for you. Then when I'm ready, I go through that, and when I'm done, um, I, just, I just save my scoring. And when I save it, it gives me this rubric part. So we've got that qualitative stuff, right, the numbers behind it, and this is more of the quality stuff, the qualitative stuff on how well the student actually did reading in it. And fluency is made up of a few different things, one of those being expression. So one is not good, four is very good, and then two and three is in between. Uh, so you just go through and mark these. There is expression and then phrasing, smoothness, and pace. 
Um, so you mark those as you see them, and then you can also give uh, some feedback. So I can say, nice work, slow it down a bit next time so you don't skip words. So very useful feedback, I'm sure. And I click finish, and that is going to record that. Now that's going to record uh, record that in that student's uh, collection of readings, and now I always have access to that. Now it's taking me back to my recent activity screen, but to show you how you would access that, um, you, at any time you can go to students, and then once you go to students, you would see a list of your students, and here is me, one of the students, and it shows me all of the passages that I've read. It's got a history of all those, and it even, um, I probably need a longer, right, so it even gives me a graph of a couple of different things. One is the words correct per minute score, which is the, um, which is the orange or yellow line, and the other is my fluency score. And so you can just kind of see how I've done over time with that, and each dot is a separate recording. Uh, so me, I'm only doing one a month or something like that. I mean, ideally, you'd want your kids to be using this two or three times, um, you know, a week when just on their own time, so that they can practice and get feedback and those sort of things. So that that allows you to have what would be your running record of that student's reading ability over time. What's really cool about this is. Let's say that you start using this in September of a school year and kids are just coming in and practicing reading and then you use this all year and now you're in March or April and you've got a parent meeting and you can go back and not only see how a student did but you can listen to a student reading you know in September and then listen to him again in April or May or whatever it may be and you can hear the difference uh, in that student's reading ability which is I just think so much more par powerful than uh, charts and graphs and numbers and those sort of things. So then in addition to this, you, you do have access to this uh, that you can always look into, but you, you, you can go down to the bottom here, do you see? So for this student, I can export this to Google Sheets. So again, just staying googly, uh, if you click that, it'll export all this data, so you'd have more than just those couple of scores into a Google spreadsheet, and then you can do with it what you'd like. You can share it, you can modify it, you can build your own charts and uh, tables and all that sort of stuff with that information, so that's how you can keep that data over time and edit it as you need. Now, I'm not sure, uh, we'll get to questions here here in just a moment. I want to make sure all that's clear. A couple other things that you can do. Notice that there are, there are some things, and this just came off of feedback. So we get feedback all the time, and we make little modifications based off that feedback. One was adding in other things beside Lexile for our passages. Um, two is the ability to get rid of some of these, because a lot of times students will read something and it's just like, you don't want to count that, it was just junk. Uh, they were just practicing around or messing around with it. So you can go and click these recordings and go down and you can uh, you can choose to archive them. Archive will not show up unless you uh, unless you actually check a box first. So that's, uh, so that's one of the main things. Another thing to know is, so this part isn't necessarily a premium feature, it's just that you wouldn't have any of the scores unless you had premium access. So you'll always have a history of the student recordings that you can go back and listen to, but without premium access you wouldn't have been able to score them. You do get 30 days for free of all of everything when you first sign up. It just starts your 30-day trial. So you can do that and if you if you do score any student activities uh, there, then you, you will keep those. You will not lose access to them, plus you can export them and, and all that sort of stuff. If you want more than 30 days, you know that you can obviously pay for it, but uh, it, you, one of the easiest things to do is refer a teacher. If you refer, a you get a little link, if you refer a teacher to give Fluency Tutor a try, all they have to do is try it and you get another 30 days. So there are plenty of teachers that get 10 other teachers to try it and now all of a sudden they've got a full school year um, worth of, of access to the premium pieces of, uh, of Fluency Tutor is there as well. But again, if you don't have premium access, you still have access to all the, uh, the native files and, um, and being able to see the tools used and being able to hear it and give them kind of that thumbs up or try again and those sort of things as well. 
so you know I think that's 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 where we are with the demo of things. Um, I am happy to show or answer any additional questions that we have. Um, just going back to the recent activity screen, Kathleen, I'll, are there any questions that come through, or can you think of anything that I, I um, else that I've, I've missed here that I need to be sure to bring up to folks? Um, there was one question about how to remove a class. So, like, if you're using Google Classroom, how like how does that syncing work, and how can you manage your classes that way? I know you can't really show it on yours, but maybe you could talk through that a little bit. Yeah, you're right. Uh, I can't. So, yeah, that's going to be a tough one for me to show <laughs> for. Um, for Classroom, so this does integrate in with Classroom, and the way it would work is you will see a, uh, whenever you go to share a passage, you'll see that you can connect this with Google Classroom, and when it does, it will just auto-sync with your Classroom. There's actually an option uh, there that allows you to, uh, that, that will allow you to sync up with your Classroom, so that way if you make class, or if you make changes to Classroom, or now you've got new classes and all that, all that will stay updated, and uh, uh, you know, it, it'll sync up with Classroom and allow you to share with all your students. Or in some cases, some people use Classroom differently. Some people have Classroom and just use it with like their third grade class with all students. Other people do like Classroom A, B, and C, which may be uh, kind of code for reading ability. So Class A gets certain passages, while B gets other passages, and C gets other passages, and those sort of things. Uh, so I know that's not useful, but I believe we have some support articles specifically on Classroom, uh, so that, that way you can at least see the screenshots and and, uh, and and help things that go along with it. Unfortunately, because I don't have a G Suite for Education account, I don't have Classroom access, so I'm not logged into it. Are there other, uh, that was a really bad answer, I think, Kathleen, but are, <laughs> are there questions I can give better answers to? Uh, we had a request to see the how to assign comprehension questions again, how to assign them and how to preview them. Right, sure thing. So if I go to, uh, so okay, so two things. I'll go to uh, share a passage, and again, comprehension questions are only part of our native passages. And here I've got pages worth of, uh, of these. So if I go to a canine reading buddy passage and click on it, I can see the comprehension questions here. Um, so that shows me there are four comprehension questions with each passage, and it shows me what they are and what the correct answer is. Now, if I want to assign this, uh, I, I can assign it either through Classroom. And here you see, even when I hover over top of Classroom, it gives me the option to automatically sync my students. It's just not going to work because I don't have Classroom access. Um, but if I go to the settings here, I can say require students to answer comprehension questions. And if I click that, when a student hits finish, they're going to get those comprehension questions. And then whenever I go to look at their uh, look at their running record or their score, I will see a comprehension question score there as well. So that's how you uh, how you access the comprehension questions. I did notice something on here as well. You can search by tags. So whenever you can search for passages, if I just go to share a passage, um, you can filter these. So you probably don't want to go through hundreds of passages to find just the one you want. You can sort by Lexile. So if I click on Lexile, it'll sort by Lexile. In this case, it's starting. Here are some passages that I pulled from the web that don't have any Lexiles associated with them. If I reverse sort, it goes with the highest Lexile level, which is equivalent to about a reading age 15, and then goes down from there. DRA doesn't actually go with the Lexile this high, so there's like a mid-level where DRA and Lexile uh, work well together. But you can also go into a filter, and if I click on a filter, you can do several things. I can search by a minimum and maximum Lexile level, the same with DRA or even reading age. You can even do keywords, and keywords would search the title um, or content of articles, but if there are tags, um, we all the articles or all the Everything in here has tags associated with them. I think the last one said dogs and canine or something. But you can also add your own tag to any passage, and that way you can easily find that later. Or if you're creating your own content, again, you can add your own tags to it, and that way it makes it searchable for you later. So a couple of more advanced things there that you can do. Hopefully that's useful. Anything else, Kathleen, that came through? Um, we did get a question, how much is the premium version? And then are there any additional discounts available, like for larger numbers of purchases? Oh, good questions. Yes, uh, 
Yeah, so it's right. It's ninety nine dollars for a classroom. Um, so if if you're a teacher or even if you're like a reading specialist, it's ninety nine bucks, and you can use it with all the students that you want, uh, unlimited use and shares and all that kind of stuff. And it is a yearly fee. And there are discounts based on volume. I would have to look at the uh, the pricing thing, but it's like for one through nine is going to be ninety nine bucks each. Ten or more, you're going to get ten percent off. Then there's another level where you'll get up to twenty percent off. Uh, so if you know if, if you end up using it in your whole district, you could get uh, a bigger discount there. But yeah, there are volume discounts, but the main price is ninety nine bucks for a classroom. That's for all the students you want to use it with, and that's good for a year. Good stuff. Hope that answers that. And uh, pretty good. Everything else has been handled. Do you think? Uh, let's see. Well, there was a question about um, so if you create custom content, would you have the ability to also create comprehension questions? That is on our. It's no, you can't. But that's on. It's on our backlog of requests that we're looking into. There's quite a bit of work that goes into it to make uh, a way for you to create your own comprehension questions for it. So no, you currently cannot. But we are looking into it. Other things that come up a lot is like different languages and things like that. There is, if you look here at the bottom left, you can see it's got this English uh, U.S. kind of um, that's that's the wording for it. But if, if you're if you want to do uh, like U.K. English instead, as far as spelling and stuff goes, you can switch your locale, and that will switch like things, the default voice and the spelling and those sort of things. You can change <clears throat> as far as other languages for the passages. English, it's only in English now. I mean, again, you can have UK English, Australian English, things like that. So the spelling would be a bit different, but it is still all English. Um, we're looking into potentially localizing some of the passages, but loads of, of work goes into to making sure that's all correct. You can, however, go to a website or create your own content. So if you need French content, you can easily go to a French website, create that content, and then uh, use a French voice. So the UI, the user interface, would still be in English, but the passages themselves and the support whenever you're having it read aloud would be in French or Spanish or whatever language you chose there. Anything else? Do you want to maybe run through how the refer a teacher works one more time? Yep, sure thing. So uh, a couple of things that you can do here. The, uh, so the easiest way is you click on refer a teacher and here you you get your own little code so it's going to look the same for everyone until you get to the very end here and this end piece is your unique code and it just automatically generates that for you now I can go to Google Plus or Facebook and or Twitter and share this and anybody that clicks on it and installs Fluency Tutor I'll know that they came through that code so you'll just automatically you see my version expires uh, in March of 2020. So I've just referred lots of people. So that's why mine expires so far out. Um, but you can uh, you, you can share it that way. You'll also see, it, it doesn't happen the same for me here, but the more you use it, you'll get some little pop-ups occasionally, little social share things that says, hey, your student's really improving. Uh, you know, click here to share the wealth. And when you do that, again, it just populates with your little code. That way we know anybody that comes in using this code came from you and then you'll get an extra 30 days immediately as soon as they actually install Fluency Tutor. They don't have to buy it or anything like that. They just have to give it a try and you'll get an extra 30 days from there. You don't have to use these little social sharing things, obviously. You can just copy and paste that code and send an email to somebody as well. I think that takes care of all the questions. Awesome. Good stuff. So we scheduled this for an hour. I figured it would take 45 minutes or so. Um, it, it took a little under that, and then plus some questions here at the end. So, so it's always good. I don't think anyone's ever upset to leave a little early. But uh, if there are any more questions, you can populate them in there now. Uh, otherwise, you know, let me just go back here so you have my contact information. If there's anything you guys need or you have any questions um, or something didn't sound right or whatever it may be, just reach out to me and let me know. Um, you're going to get a follow-up email to this as well. That will probably come from me or from uh, maybe Caitlin there. But you'll, you're going to get a copy of, of this webinar so you can refer back to any pieces that you missed. You're going to get a, a link to 
the webinar that Vicki Davis did where she went through 15 great tools that you can use if you're a G Suite user. You'll also get access to a little uh, one or two pager that's a nice little kind of handout that you can print off that references these, uh, these different tools as well. So uh, if there's nothing else, Kathleen, that'll be it. I'll, I'll wrap this up and everybody will get an email from us here shortly. Great. All right. Well, thanks, guys. I uh, appreciate everyone joining us, and I hope to catch you again soon.